with me to the book of James, James chapter 4. James chapter 4. The book of James was written to save people. And I think sometimes we get the idea that when a person trusts Jesus Christ as Savior, all your troubles go away. And, you know, everything, is, is, uh, everything turns into a path of roses. Well, that's really not, the, not necessarily the case. However, what God does give to us when we're saved is not only does he give us first, obviously, uh, first and foremost, eternal life, but then secondly, he gives us the opportunity to overcome our problems and to have victory uh, in, in our lives on a daily basis. But there are some things that are necessary uh, in order to have that victory. And those are the things we're going to look at this morning. We're going to be looking at uh, some uh, necessary attitudes for victory in the Christian life. By now you should be at James chapter 4. Let's stand together if you would. James chapter 4, and you read along silently as I read aloud verses 1 through 5. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we, we ask your blessings upon the passage that we're looking at this morning. We ask your blessings upon our hearts as the word of God enters and may the spirit of God have freedom in this place. First of all, freedom with the speaker. I pray God that you would fill me with your spirit and give me guidance and direction as I speak. May I not say things, anything that would displease or dishonor you in any way. And then Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would have our hearts open to you that you would be able to uh, speak to our hearts, and as you speak to our hearts, we respond to you. Have your will, have your way today. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, what I just read you is really kind of a disturbing passage. It starts out pretty, pretty, pretty rough. It says, From whence come wars and fightings among you, come they not hence of your lust that war in your members. And again, we're talking about people that have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. Uh, and yet, uh, even though you're saved, that doesn't mean you're removed from all conflict. Uh, in fact, it gets so bad at times that God describes it as, as war. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a conflict that's going on in our hearts and oftentimes ends up manifesting itself from without. And there were, there were three, three areas where these people were at war. First of all, if you look in the, the first verse, it says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. And so they were, they were at war with themselves. Uh, there were arguments. There were fightings. There, were, there was uh, disagreements going on because of lusts that were not taken care of in their own, in their, with, with one another. And, and uh, because they were, were fighting with one another, it, it appeared to be like war. Then, then secondly, look down in, in the, the last part of, of verse 1. Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lust. And, and uh, what he's talking about there is, is problems just uh, in ourselves, not only with others, but also in ourselves, things that have not, have not been resolved in our own hearts. Uh, you know, the bottom line is always selfishness. 
uh, just, just more concerned about ourselves than we are about God and others. And uh, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, Isaiah 53 is a very famous uh, passage of Scripture that talks about the Savior coming and dying for our sins. But in Isaiah chapter 53, in, in, in describing us in verse 6, it says, we have turned, uh, we have turned from God's way. Uh, we've turned unto our own way. And, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why? Well, because we're basically selfish. And uh, we have turned everyone to our own way. And then the, the, third, the third thing we're at war at, and this is really the bottom line, look down in verse, verses 4 and 5. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Uh, bottom line is, is that when we get, uh, have conflicts with others, when we have conflicts in our own selves, it's because we also have conflicts with God. We're at cross purposes with the, with the Lord. And, you know, I, I said this last week, and I've, I've been saying this a lot lately, but it's, it's just so true. You cannot flirt with the world and live for God. You just can't do it. Um, you, 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 that's why the Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Uh, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And uh, uh, God tells us when it comes to to lust, he says, flee youthful lust. He doesn't say fight them. He says flee them. Why? Because you can't beat them. It's not something that that uh, you're you're too. It's too much of a match for you and for I. And we need to understand that when we when we flirt with the world like that, we're at war with God. Now there's three there's three attitudes from this passage. He goes into beginning in verse verse six. He goes into some, some solutions, and all of these solutions are not so much outward as they are inward. The things inwardly that we need to take care of in order to have victory on a day-by-day -day basis. If you look with me in verse 6, we'll read verses 6 through 8. Verse 6 says, But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Um, what is essentially always important is not first and foremost what you do, but it's first and foremost what you are, who you are in, the, in, in, in your heart. When Jesus Christ uh, preached on the, uh, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, that encompasses three entire chapters of the book of Matthew, uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. When he starts out that message, he doesn't start out with what people ought to do. He starts out with what we call, we have called the Beatitudes. And I like that because they're attitudes that we need to be or have inside of our hearts. He starts with attitudes rather than actions. Now, later on, he talks about some specific actions in the, in the sermon that are necessary. But he starts out with attitudes. And the reason why he does that is because the Lord knows that it's who we are on the inside. Evil does not come from without and come in, it comes from within and goes out. And that's why it's so important for us to have the right heart, for us to have the right attitude. So let's take a look at the, at the three attitudes, really just three basic attitudes that God says that we need to have on a daily basis. First of all, verse six, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. You know, the answer is always grace. It's always God's resources. It's always God's strength. It's always God's power. When the Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh and uh, there was a messenger of Satan that buffeted him, 
the, the, he asked three times for it to be removed, and God's answer, final answer was, I'm not going to remove it, but I'm going to give you a solution. And the solution is, my grace is sufficient. Well, you think about it, uh, that's how you start out the Christian life. I mean, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the starting point is always grace. And, and when you look at, at verse 6, it says, He giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. To the humble. I'm convinced that, that uh, the, the, one of the greatest attributes that we can have as Christians is just a, having a humble heart. Uh, you look at, the, as far as I'm concerned, one of, for sure, the greatest Christians that ever, ever lived was the Apostle Paul. Have you ever just looked at what the Apostle Paul said about himself? Now I realize he had a terrible life before he got saved. He persecuted Christians, he ran them down, uh, he held the, coat, the coats for those who murdered Stephen after he preached to them. I understand that. He, he, was, he was a terrible, terrible person, but God saved him. And he became a great Christian. He, he loved the Lord and uh, he, he loved others. And yet in the midst of that, I don't believe Paul is talking about his past life when he says these things. I believe he's talking at, at the present moment. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 9, he calls himself the least of the apostles. And, uh, and in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, he calls himself a less than the least of all saints. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, he says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He wasn't talking about his past life. He was talking about right now. Let me ask you something. I, don't raise your hand. But do you really, do you think from your standpoint, that the Apostle Paul was the worst sinner that ever lived. I don't think so. I, I think he loved the Lord. I think he, he, he served the Lord with all of his heart. But he looked at himself as the chief of sinners. He thought little of himself and he thought much of God. And you know what I, I found? I found that that's basically how that whole ratio thing goes. The more you think of yourself, the less you think of God. The less you think of yourself as a Christian, the more you'll think of God, the more you'll trust him. When, when, when we're humble and people do things against us, they trespass against us, they, they uh, do things that would normally irritate us. When we have a humble heart, and I've seen this. I've seen this in my own life. I've seen this in the life of others. You don't get angry. When you're properly humble before God, the anger is kept in check. But when the humility begins to drain out, then the, the anger comes. The irritations come. Uh, it, it, and, and, and the reason why when you're humble that those things don't bother you is because you're more concerned about the fact that the people that are doing it to you are broken. You're, you're not concerned about what they're doing to you. You're concerned about what's happening to them. And you look at them and you say, man, that, you know, they are hurting themselves. And you have a, you have a broken heart for them. That, that comes from, from humility. And when we're humble, we realize that we are capable of everything that everybody else does that we disdain. Uh, we, realize that, we realize that there is no sin that we are not capable of. And we realize our own frailty. We realize, we realize just, just how, how weak oftentimes we really are. And... Uh, God brings circumstances and God brings people into our lives in order to, to work on that humility. I, I, I believe with all my heart 
the number one thing that God works on you and I on, on a day-by-day basis, is this thing of humility. And he wants to, us to, to, he wants to get us humble, and he wants to keep us there. He wants to keep us there. I've looked, I've looked back at different things in my life, and I've looked back at different things in the lives of the people of this church. And I, re- I really believe this with all of my heart. You know, you've heard me say that, that uh, I don't know that I've seen uh, any other church like our church that has just gone through a lot of different things over its history. And, and uh, uh, people going through different things in their, in their own personal lives. A lot of hurts, a lot of disappointments, a lot of physical issues. Um, you know, someone says, well, it must be because they're all in sin. Well, maybe it is. Maybe that's what our problem is. But I, I really don't think that that's all of it. I really don't. And it may not even be most of it. You know what it is? It's God keeping us humble. And he puts us through those things so that we realize just how weak and frail we really are. And he, he puts us through the, you know, again, I look back at my own life and I, I see one thing after another, after another, after another. And I can remember many, many times, many times uh, in Wisconsin, a whole bunch of times over in Yorkshire, and many times here in Auburn, where I've just gone to God and said, God, God, I don't have an answer. God, I don't know what to do. God, I can't go any further with this thing. I can remember one time falling down on my face. This was years ago. This is over 30 years ago. Falling down on my face and said, God, obviously I'm stiff-necked. Obviously uh, I need a lot of work. I said, God, would you, just, would you just take me and break me? Break my will. Uh, and I meant it. I meant it with all my heart. Now, listen, don't pray that prayer unless you mean it. Because he'll answer it. And he did. And I'm thankful that he did. Because I needed it. Because I needed to be humbled. Uh, I, I'm convinced that humility is one of, the, one of the greatest needs that we have. And maybe the reason why we have all of the problems sometimes that we look at and we see that we have you know, health issues and financial issues and, and, and personal conflicts and so forth. All those things are like chisels that God is using in our lives to try to knock the pride off and get us to be humble before him. You think about this. Could you have gotten saved had you not humbled yourself before God? I'll tell you what the answer is. The answer is no. No, you couldn't. The only way a person can get saved is by humbling themselves before God and saying, God, I'm a sinner. I'm on my way to hell. Uh, The only way that can go to heaven, the only way I can have my sins forgiven is for you to forgive all my sins through your death, burial, and resurrection and come to God helpless. That's what he wants. And come to God and say, God, if you don't save me, I'm lost for all eternity. Um, that's humility. Well, that's where it starts. Well, in our verse, uh, in our, pa- our passage for the month, it says, as we have received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. Just like God want, wanted and it was necessary for us to be humble before him when we got saved, it's necessary for us to be humble on our daily walk with him. Second thing that he talks about, that he points out to us, is found in verse 7. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. It says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. This is a, a, a continual submitting that we're to do. Keep your, keep your finger here and go with me, if you would, over to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verses 13 through 13 through 19. Romans 6, 13 through 19. Romans 6, 13 says, Neither yield ye your members 
as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members are instruments of righteousness unto God. In other words, it's a submission, it's a yielding, telling God that you want him to have his way, not you have your way. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. When you get saved, you're no longer under the law. The law is your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. Once you get saved, you're under grace. But what then? Shall we sin? Verse 15, because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of, of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so, now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. In other words, before you got saved, you didn't have a choice. Sin was your master. But when you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, a sin no longer has power over you. Now, can you, can you yield yourself still to sin? Yes, you can. But God says, no, instead I want you to yield yourself to righteousness. He wants us to yield ourselves to him and to submit ourselves to him. It's just simply a, a surrendering ourselves to God to do what he would will. Take your Bibles and turn with me over to, uh, keep your finger in James, go to the book of, he, of uh, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. And again, this is, he's, he's speaking here to save people. He's talking to a church that he helped start. And, and uh, in verse 14, God says, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now he's not talking to lost people. He's talking to saved people who have fallen asleep, and they need to be, they need to be stirred. And he says, he, he just simply says, uh, Arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Listen, if they were evil back then, how much more are they evil today? Verse 17, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, he's going to tell us what the will of the Lord is. And verse 18, and be not drunk with wine or in his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, don't make that thing, filling of the Spirit, any more difficult than it is. I remember early on in my ministry, uh, back in Green Bay, uh, I, I, I uh, did a lot of reading on the filling of the Spirit. And I came to a conclusion after reading everybody else's experiences and everybody else's take on the thing. The name, the word filled just simply means to be controlled by. That's all it means. It just simply means to be controlled. When you say, when, when somebody gets really upset and they are filled with jealousy, what does that mean? Well, that means the jealousy is controlling them. When we say he was filled with anger, what does that mean? That means the anger got a hold of him and was controlling him. When we say he was filled with the Spirit of God, what does that mean? It means you're just submitting to him. You're letting God have his way instead of you have your way and me have mine. Verse 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. You know what that is? That's a happy spirit. When, when God's controlling you, instead of you controlling you, then, then you're, you have joy in your heart. And, and in verse 20, he says, giving thanks always for all things unto God 
and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Christian life is a life of submission. Of submission first and foremost to God and then secondly to others. Uh, we're, we're, to, we're to be surrendered. We're to be submissive. When, when Jesus was in the garden just before he, he went to the cross, he got down on his knees and he prayed to the Father. And he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. I don't believe for five seconds that that cup that he was referring to was the cross. It wasn't the cross, and I've heard some people teach that, that he was, he was saying, if it's possible, let me avoid the cross. No, Jesus came to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus came to die on the cross. But what he was referring to, and you can look this up later over in Psalm 11, verses 5 and 6, and Psalm 75, verse 8, talks about, talks about a cup of dregs, a, a cup of wickedness, a cup of vileness. And when, when he was on that cross, he bore our sins, the Bible says, in his own body on the tree. And he took the, he took the disdain from God the Father uh, on that tree. He, he didn't deserve a bit of it. He didn't do anything that was wrong. But here's, here's what his attitude was. Not my will, but thine be done. That's the kind of attitude we need to have every single day day when we get out of bed and say, God, I have a desire. And my desire is to have your will to be done in my life and not my will to be done in my, in my life. That's, that's just simply a, a, an attitude of submission. And then the, the third attitude that he says that's necessary, look down in verses 8 through 10. In verse 8 it says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift, and he shall lift the, you up. The, la the last attitude that's necessary is, a, is an attitude of repentance. And that's just simply coming to God and having a desire to be clean, having a desire to be pure. He says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Uh, I've, I've heard this said by others, and I've said it often, uh, and it is so true. <clears throat> you are just exactly as close to God right now as you want to be. If you wanted to be closer, you could be closer. The thing that prevents us from getting close to God is ourselves. And what we need to do is we need to have a repentant attitude and a desire to be clean before him. Uh, God, uh, since the day I got saved, God continually shows me new areas, or sometimes it's the old areas that I've let slip, where I need to get right what needs to happen is, as soon as God shows you those things, you need to take, make, pay attention to it and repent of those things immediately. It's an immediate type of thing that we need to do. Uh, notice in, down, in verse, uh, down in verse 8, he says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. There's two aspects of which we need to repent. It says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. In other words, there are deeds that we have done with our hands, physically, outwardly, that are wrong. We need to repent of them. And at times, we need to make restitution. At times, we need to make apologies. At times, uh, we need to, to, to do whatever we can to rectify the situation. But they're, they're outward things. They're things that we've done with our hands. It says, cleanse your hands, your sinners, ye sinners. And then he says, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Understand that it's not all what you've done. It's what you are. It's what is going on in your heart. It's the, it's the attitude that was wrong 
that needs to repent of, be repented of. Yes, we need to repent of actions. There's no doubt about it. But here's the question you got to ask yourself. Okay, what attitude did I have that caused me to do the wrong action? What caused me to fly off the handle? What caused me to, to lust after that thing I should not have lusted after? What, what caused me to lie? What caused me to steal? What caused me to hurt that person's feelings? What was the, yes, should I, should I make right to the best of my ability the outward thing that I've done? Yes, you should. But if that's all you do, all, all you're doing is taking care of the outward action, but you're doing nothing about the inward attitude. You know, I, I, I have, I've come to the realization that, that uh, I need to not only go to people when I apologize and apologize for what I did, but I also need to apologize for why I did it. Uh, you get upset and you snap at someone. And uh, you say, well, I shouldn't have snapped at you. I shouldn't have been angry at you. Well, it goes further than that. I, sh I shouldn't have been so selfish. I shouldn't have been so self-centered. I, sh I should not. And there, there are other things that are possibly that were going on on the inside of my heart. Those things need to be acknowledged. And those things need to be repented of. Um, when true repentance takes place, you don't blame anybody but yourself. Um, we oftentimes, when people approach us about things that are, are problems and difficulties in our own lives, <clears throat> I, I know what happens. I've seen it happen with us. I've seen it happen with myself over and over and over again. The old defense shield comes up. And you immediately try to give excuses for why you did what you did that was wrong or why you let something slip. And the truth of the matter is God doesn't want excuses. He wants repentance. He wants to have a, a heart that has a desire to be clean. Not just the hands to be clean, but for the heart to be clean. And to take full responsibility for, for your sin and not make any excuses. Uh, take, your, take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Leviticus, chapter 26. Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. And look with me in verse 40. Now, this is God speaking to Israel and talking to them about about uh, confessing their iniquity. They had gone against God. In verse 40, he says, If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass, which they trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me. In other words, I'm wrong. You know, God, you're right. I'm wrong. I take full accountability for my actions. Verse 41 and that I also have walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their, their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled and they accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. He says, not only do you need to admit that, that you were wrong, but be willing to take, take uh, uh, full responsibility for your deeds and understand that all that you received as a punishment for what, in other words, all the consequences of your sin are absolutely, fully, completely deserved. You say, yeah, but I, I really didn't think that it would get that bad. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And what we need to be willing to do is to, is to not only admit that we did wrong, but accept the consequences for our sins. That shows a brokenness. That shows a humbleness. That shows a repentant heart. I remember years ago there was a situation, this was in the ministry in, in Green Bay, 
and uh, there was a situation that had to be taken care of. And of course, it happened on the day when my pastor had the day off and I was in charge. And so uh, I ended up having to approach the individual who had, who had done wrong. And uh, I brought him into the office and I talked to him about it. And, uh, and I, I, I told him, I'd already talked to the pastor and the preacher said, you can, you can tell him to do this and this and this. And so um, I said, these are the consequences of your actions. And he just looked at me and said, I don't think so. I said, pardon me? I said, didn't you say that it was wrong? Yes, but I'm not gonna take that for a consequence. What I found was that yes, the man admitted that he did wrong, but he wasn't really repentant. One of the things that, that will measure whether or not you have a truly humble and repentant heart is if you're willing to take the consequences of your sins. And then go back with me, if you would, to James chapter four and look in verse 10. It says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. When you do these, these three things, when you have a, a humble spirit, when you have a submissive heart to God, and you allow God to control you, and you have a repentant heart, not just, not just repent of the deed, but also repent of the attitude, then God says that he'll lift you up. He'll, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll, he'll bring lifting, he'll bring strength in your Christian life. Now, if you, if you look at this, these three things, humility, submission, and repentance, those are not only attitudes that are necessary in order for us to have victory on a day-by-day -day basis. Do you know what else they are? They're also the attitudes I had to have the day I got saved. I had to come to God humbly, realizing I can't save myself. I had to come to God with a submissive heart, saying, listen, if you tell me one thing and I believe something else, I'm wrong and you're right. And when I, when I, when I came to the Lord and got saved, um, prior to that, I believed you go to heaven by your good works. And I found out through the scripture that wasn't the case. It had nothing to do with works of righteousness that I had done, but according to his mercy that he saved us. And so it was, by, it was by what Christ had done, not me. It wasn't baptism, it wasn't church membership, it wasn't being a good person, it wasn't obeying the Ten Commandments, it wasn't any of those things. It didn't make any difference how good or bad I was as far as getting forgiveness of sin. It had everything to do with trusting Christ as Savior. Now, I didn't believe that when I walked into the church building that night. I believed it when I, when I walked out because I took my beliefs and I pitched them and submitted to what God said. And then last of all is repentance. Realizing the, the depth of your sin and turning from your sin, not just what you did, but the attitudes in your heart that caused it. And when a, when a person humbles themselves, submits to God and repents and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, they, be, they get saved. As you received Christ Jesus, so walk ye in him. The same attitudes that were necessary when we got saved are necessary in order to have victory on a daily basis in our lives. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heads bowed and eyes closed. In just a moment, we're going to give an invitation and an invitation is just simply that. It's an invitation to respond to that which you've heard and to allow God to have his way in your heart if God's working there. But I want to ask you a question, and actually a couple of questions. First of all, do you know for sure if you died today that you go to heaven? Are you absolutely positive? Can you look back to a specific time in your life where you went from darkness into light? where you were dead in your sins, but because you believed on Christ at that moment, Christ gave you life. 
You know for sure that if you died today, you go to heaven because you, you've trusted Christ and him alone is your savior. I wonder if you might raise your hand as a testimony of that, that fact. Heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. Just raise your hand and just say, I, I know I've trusted Christ as savior. All right, thank you. You can put your hands down. Is there anyone that would be here be equally as honest and say, I don't know for sure. Would you please pray for me? Anyone like that? All right, you're here this morning. And maybe you're, maybe you're struggling with some things in your life. I'll tell you, the Christian life is full of struggles. But these three attitudes, humility and submission and repentance, are absolutely necessary on a daily basis. And just by an uplifted hand, you say, Preacher, the uh, Lord's spoken to my heart about something in particular this morning. Uh, pray for me. I need help. I need grace. Uh, pray that God would work in my life. Thank you. I see that hand. I see that one. I see that one. And that one. All right. Hands all over. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for working in hearts. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of it. And thank you, Lord, for pointing out to us what is necessary on a daily basis in our lives. So oftentimes we emphasize the outward and we neglect the inward and yet uh, God you make it very very plain that uh, we need to have a humble spirit and when we lose our humility we lose our our love for you a little bit we lose our love for others a lot and uh, God I pray that uh, you would work on our hearts in the area of being humble, of being submissive, and uh, Lord, just simply having a repentant spirit when we're confronted about our sins by you. I pray for those that raise their hands, that, that uh, uh, have indicated that you've pointed something out to them, something that you're dealing with them with. I pray, Father, that today would be the day of decision and uh, Lord, that you give them the strength and you give them the grace that they need. Father, work in this invitation and do what only you can do inside of our hearts. And we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen.